The last talk for today, and unfortunately, it means we are coming toward the end of FOSTEM. So, how many of you have been to FOSTEM PG Day, which happened on Friday? Awesome. So, if you haven't heard before, we every year, just before FOSTEM, we organize FOSTEM PG Day, uh, one day for Postgres, if this is not enough for you. And then just, uh, just, just, <laughs> just visit FOSTEMPGday.org uh, for more details. So, we will be here again next year. So the final talk of today is from Ilya, uh, one of our most famous speakers in the community. <laughs> he is. Thank you, Devram. <laughs> and then, so he's going to speak about the latest evolution of Linux IOS stake, explain for the database people, not hackers. Yeah, thank you, Devram. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, that's the last talk. My congratulations, you pretty much survived this, uh, which is a good sign probably. Uh, the bad side that uh, as the last talk, uh, after almost three day marathon, it would be about boring Linux things. Uh, but I tried to do that, uh, not that boring, <laughs> probably. Uh, and well, the main problem with such talks uh, could be that you need to cover too many things like uh, you need to explain how databases works, uh, how Postgres works, for example, then how Linux works, and then how it comes together. So I try to solve this uh, not easy task. Uh, let's go. So why we talk? Uh, first of all, Linux is uh, quite important for the databases. I would say today is actually the default operating system for database use. For a long time, it was not like that. Uh, Solaris, HPX, uh, sometimes Windows, uh, many operating systems are used for databases. Now, actually, like it works usually in open source world. Uh, many, even commercial database companies, investing in Linux to achieve a better performance for their database. And Postgres, uh, regret to say, maybe for a FreeBSD project of from OpenBSD project, uh, now somehow aimed just to improve performance on Linux. Not because those operating systems are worse, but because, well, um, Linux is uh, what people want to run Postgres. And then the central thing for database workload is fast I.O. Because, you know, sometimes uh, we run into CPU problems, sometimes we run into this and that, but, well, if we have intensive workloads, I am most likely a common problem uh, which we need to fight with. Uh, well, another problem is then you try to figure out what to do with Linux and its IO stack to improve your PostgreSQL, MySQL performance, for example, is that uh, you can find some posts on Linux network, uh, some emails into some uh, mailing lists like Postgres hackers or kernel mailing lists. Uh, and all the information you can find there is actually made uh, by developers and the language like they use uh, requires a lot of knowledge and it's written basically for kernel developers, so not for DBAs. And that task I tried to solve. I tried to uh, get some clue in which n direction you need to go for a Google for, to dig for information. And another problem is actually that uh, Linux IO stack recently uh, redeveloped quite intensively because for a long time it was uh, really lots of problems inside the Linux IO stack, uh, different other problems which kernel developers need to solve. So for a long time it was like uh, nothing happened, nothing happened, and recently uh, during the uh, development cycle of uh, version 3 and version 4 and now version 5, uh, it's really everything changes and whole systems uh, are overhauled, etc. So what we are talking today about, very brief introduction. Uh, especially for the first line, how Postgres work with disk, uh, <laughs> and uh, then a slightly historical part, uh, what was 
in Linux with I.O. in old good times of old kernels. And then brief introduction what was new. So basically, maybe you will not have the complete picture after this talk, but at least you need uh, to put down the keywords uh, where to find the information after that. So a very typical database uh, based on these two uh, things, you will guess that this typical database is typical PostgreSQL database. Works uh, in with a kernel space, with the kernel memory, the page cache for kernel buffer, uh, and it works with a user space, its own shared memory segment. So Linux takes care of this part, and database uh, code takes uh, care on this part. And basically the same idea, this uh, page model is for many years here, and that's very convenient Then you read some information from the disk, you just uh, put the whole page in memory, and then if you change, uh, if you do, uh, do not change something, it's quite easy. It's just like modern in-memory database. You just can read uh, some information, return as a select. But when it comes to updates, uh, you can mark some of the pages as dirty pages, and then the I/O problem starts usually. So uh, if you update something, you need to uh, write write the head log. And actually, at some point, you have your information about your recent updates in uh, your right ahead log. And this memory snapshot is inconsistent uh, comparing to uh, the disk uh, image. So from time to time, you need to issue the uh, nightmare of the NEDBA, uh, especially 10 years ago, uh, the checkpoint. And all the dirty pages are going down uh, to the disk, and that's that I/O problem you usually hit. Uh, so basically, if you had only read workload, that's not that bad. Then you have writes. That probably can be a problem for you. Uh, if we are talking about database, because we can talk about uh, full text storage, about file server, for um, a database, there are very uh, specific key features for uh, its workload. Shared memory today, uh, well, could be defined uh, with uh, the prices of RAM. And then I started to perform talks about how to tune Linux for Postgres. I used to say, well, now 32 gigs of memory are cheap. Uh, some people started to laugh because uh, it was quite expensive at that time. Uh, now, actually, I would say that one terabyte of memory is not that expensive. So uh, basically, you can have a lot of memory on your uh, database server, and you need to uh, use specific settings. And well, Linux and database, your database, your favorite database, Postgres, I hope, should adopt to, to that. Uh, so it can be really a lot of uh, data. And then you synchronizing those pages, uh, this huge amount of data travels uh, down and up. So basically, uh, here's the I/O problems. Uh, besides of that, there are different things with I/O which can be not that bad, like uh, checkpoint spikes. Uh, but well, they can be still troublesome. Like write ahead log should be uh, written quite good. That have some limitations on copyright file system sometimes. Uh, and well, pretty much every point of this IO stack should be optimized for that exactly type of workload. Then we put loads of uh, dirty pages uh, down to the disks. Uh, what generates most of IO problems in Postgres? As I said, this page synchronization, when we need to write a lot. Uh, besides of this, auto vacuum can be sometimes troublesome, but well, it uh, it depends on exactly how your workload works. Sometimes cache refill can be bad, but well, today many of you, I'm sure, are using SSDs, SSD disks, which is much better. Uh, and sometimes you can have 
lots of problems with uh, normal Postgres workers uh, with their I.O. But this is out of scope of this talk, and basically I can say then uh, your ordinary uh, PostgreSQL processes uh, performing some I.O. operations, uh, that's generally bad and you need to avoid that. Like uh, those processes are not designed to uh, make checkpoints, for example. If they try to uh, dump the dirty pages to the disk, that means that actually something uh, is quite wrong in your database setup. That's an emergency measure, it's not like a uh, normal process. Uh, so for a long time, uh, for databases, the huge problem was how to maximize the throughput. Uh, this word throughput was quite common for all talks uh, about database performance in terms of I.O. Uh, and well, uh, when you're talking about throughput from the user space, from the database to, to the disks, every part of uh, this uh, stack could be involved. Um, and most likely we are talking about throughput because uh, this part of the sta stack, well, uh, of the stack was quite uh, vulnerable. Uh, the disk was slow. So because the disk was uh, disk were quite slow, uh, a lot of efforts uh, and time of uh, developers of Linux, uh, kernel of Postgres, were actually concentrated around uh, how to maximize throughput in the rest of the, uh, this stack. Because latency of the disk was quite high. We need to move the heads on the disk and so on, which could not be improved. Uh, and most people are looking on these, not on these. But technology uh, actually don't stay uh, in one place and uh, some evolution actually goes on and the situation change. Why I actually concentrate um, on throughput and latency? Uh, if we have uh, like so complicated IO stack, uh, it's actually sometimes easier to maximize throughput like uh, using parallelism where we can uh, the typical example of this um, well uh, not cor correctly parallelism but some helper process was like then PostgreSQL checkpointer cannot manage uh, the checkpoint the dumping of all those dirty pages um, PostgreSQL people came up and invented the uh, background writer. So between checkpoints, we can use background writer to help checkpointer. Uh, that's a typical example of uh, maximizing throughput because we could not minimize latency anymore. Uh, because, yeah, minimizing latency is quite tricky. But now the situation changed, uh, and now we have SSDs, uh, which uh, probably uh, do not make the DBA job obsolete, but they can actually reduce this uh, latency component in the IO stack. Uh, and the whole system need to be adopted for uh, this modern situation. So um, because of high latency of rotating disk, that's some historical part, uh, there was lots of effort how to improve the performance of uh, this stack in terms of throughput. And uh, you know probably all these recipes like you need to tune VM, uh, dirty ratio, and those things. Uh, that was the times of uh, rotating disks, as well as better backed cache and things like this. Uh, so um, this is like the DBA task to tune those parameters and so on. But inside the Linux kernel, there are lots of internal optimizations like that. We're using SSDs, but the methods inside the Linux kernel are designed to uh, move uh, the heads on the disk efficiently. But SSD has no heads, basically, and it is a much more parallel aware thing compared to even disk array. So uh, this is an IO stack. 
Uh, we can use direct I.O., we can use uh, page cache. In terms of Postgres, we use page cache. But we need to go through all this stack. Uh, well, file system, that's nothing interesting here probably, but there are lots of benchmarks about this. Um, there are several approaches how to improve file system performance. For example, do not use write barrier on uh, X4. But we actually look deeper into the kernel. Uh, in the kernel, there is a so-called uh, bio layer, or block input output layer. Uh, and the task of this uh, part of uh, the kernel is actually to form uh, input output request. So this is basically bio C structure. Uh, and we take those blocks like, like in database practically. Uh, and we form some vector of those blocks to put it finally to the disk. Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, we operate pages inside our database and in user space. Uh, and on the disk, on the old disk, we are operating with uh, cylinders, sectors, and those rotating things, uh, heritage, which was quite obvious than people were programming those uh, SD driver, SCSI, and so on. And this part of the Linux IO stack was specially designed to make some smooth and efficient transition from the pages to the cylinders, sectors, uh, and those old school things with rotating disks. Then we actually form the request which goes for I.O. and instructs driver, like put this piece of data there and so on. Um, we can optimize uh, the input and output in some way. And basically for a long time all this optimization was about uh, where we store this data. If uh, we can just dump this data to the, uh, to the disk using single uh, movement of the uh, disk head, that's efficient. So all the optimization here was based to uh, like merge and sort uh, these uh, vectors of uh, blocks uh, to fit uh, to the disk if they, for example, can be stored together. Uh, and that's why emerged this idea to have an elevator or IO scheduler, uh, which can actually help with sorting of all those pages and uh, putting them to the disk in most efficient manner. Uh, before uh, the kernel uh, 2.6, quite old time, um, there was uh, just a single elevator, so-called Linus elevator. Uh, and, well, it was like many things which Linus made himself uh, consider it as a perfect thing, very simple, and very good working. Uh, but, in effect, uh, nobody just cares if it works. So it's just, uh, it does something, uh, if it does that efficient, nobody knows. We have disk latency, and, well, to optimize disk latency, uh, it's difficult, a physical limitation, so we just uh, use something. Uh, and this type of elevator had lots of problems, mostly because uh, it doesn't fit the job even for rotating disks. But for uh, modern disks, that simply wouldn't work. Uh, starvation, then you, then you write some information, you need to read information from another part of the disk, etc., etc. So, lots of problems. Uh, between uh, kernel 2.6 uh, and early versions of um, third kernel, uh, some people come up and invented some different schedulers. But actually, inside uh, the logic of those schedulers, there's still pretty much some improvements over the old Linus elevator. Uh, the first of them, more universal and more typical, was like uh, complete fair queuing. The idea behind this uh, type of elevator is like uh, you have processes, and for each process you uh, provide input-output queue, which basically provides fair access to um, input-output. But 
when we have Postgres, just imagine how efficient it would be. For example, you have some connection to the database and you have some percent of uh, IO. Uh, when we have auto vacuum process, it basically have the same access to the IO. Then we have chip pointer and it has the same access to the IO. This is pretty much not very efficient because for chip pointer we need a lot of IO. For a normal PostgreSQL process which performs on select, we probably do not need any IO at all. Maybe it just takes the data from the cache or uh, just uh, handles the connection of the DBA, uh, which is idle. So we don't know. So for a specific workload like database, this scheduler was always not that universal, not that good. Maybe for a desktop environment it was better. Then emerged the deadline scheduler. Deadline scheduler was like some sort of uh, uh, improving the, uh, the idea for improving the situation. Uh, basically it has uh, two types of uh, queues, like queue for reading, queue for writing. Uh, and it just starts to read or to write, but all the requests are actually uh, tagged with um, timestamp. And that timestamp allows kernel to figure out uh, if this request timeouted or not. And if it is timeouted, like we have huge amount of uh, information to write, it takes long time, we hit the timeout, uh, then the kernel changes the priority of this uh, queue. So basically, uh, if we have a lot of input output, finally it would rise in priority and work more efficiently. It did. It actually, for rotating disk uh, with normal rate controllers, it was much better than uh, CFQ. But still not perfect. And, well, especially not perfect for SSDs. And some people come up with uh, idea of no op or none uh, scheduler for um, devices which allows uh, much more parallel uh, execution of I.O. Like disk arrays, SSDs, the main difference is like they <coughs> allow much more parallelism. And this idea was like basically this scheduler doesn't uh, change anything. It doesn't perform uh, merging, sorting, things like that. Uh, it just do nothing. So it's like a placeholder for um, a scheduler. And it was, it turns out it was much more efficient for uh, high parallel storages in compare, uh, comparing to other two. Uh, and probably at that point or slightly earlier, uh, many people started to work on uh, real improvements of IO stack. And now we actually hit um, some terminology problems. Uh, because um, as you remember on that diagram with uh, stack, uh, there was a IO scheduler which was some part of the kernel working with request layer. Uh, there's lo lots of discussions if we need to improve this, but finally um, Linux developers came up with idea that we need to substitute practically a lot of these. So basically not only substitute the whole request layer and add some uh, elevator here, but uh, adopt the device driver to work with a new analog of request layer and probably change many things here. So um, after uh, the new approach emerged, uh, we practically have a new input-output stack. Uh, part of this is NVMe or uh, non-volatile memory uh, uh, driver uh, and part of this is so-called bulk MQ, uh, which is the scheduler and uh, the request layer uh, simultaneously. And now it actually has some new schedulers inside. Uh, because of effectiveness of this knob, uh, just uh, the idea was we need uh, the IO scheduling, which is initially designed to support lots of parallelism. Uh, first, uh, this thing was introduced in uh, 
3.13, and I think the latest version was merged into the uh, kernel 4.10 together with NVMe. So before that, it was not that efficient, but you can probably uh, run into it and probably use that uh, together with uh, late third kernels um, if you use uh, NVMe, because NVMe, um, it says that it's no op, but basically in late third kernels it was uh, NVMe, uh, in spite of, of what you can see in your grub or uh, whatever. Uh, so the idea is that uh, SCSI uh, is not parallel and you cannot scale your input-output requests. So basically if from user space Postgres with F-Sync in Checkpointer. You initiate the right uh, request, it goes straight to the disk driver, whatever you have uh, beneath. Uh, and this is a problem, basically, because you issue input-output request, it doesn't scale. It basically goes through the hardware. Uh, how to improve those things? The old approach to elevators was like, we have a CPU, a queue and the disk, and that's just straightforward. So we basically go through, and uh, if we are busy, we are busy. Uh, then, uh, at some point, uh, there were some special queues for single process, for example, which tends to be slightly more effective, but still not. Uh, the game change for bulk MQ approach was that it basically uh, parallelized the queuing. And now uh, in Linux, we have, for example, CPU or Numa node, which has each uh, its special software query. And through this software queue, we can actually put a lot of input output. And in this software queue, you can do any optimization, like tagging for specific processes of a specific virtual machine, uh, like um, sorting, merging, things like that, which tends to improve the performance on input and output. And then all of those things uh, are ended up in, Q, uh, in queues on the hardware. And in case if we have an SSD, we usually have more than one hardware queue. And this is much more efficient. So basically we got the parallelism on the level of request layer. That's why it's substitution of request layer, not the just uh, scheduler which works uh, aside. Uh, so basically, uh, then we rebuilt the, uh, this part of the stack. Um, people start to think that we actually need another scheduler. Uh, but the scheduler which can be aware of uh, modern SSDs. Uh, currently, there are two major schedulers for uh, bulk MQ and VME uh, aware kernels, newer kernels. One of them, which is more complicated, and some people uh, tend to compare it to CFQ, is BFQ, or budget fair queuing. Uh, the idea is uh, it has some math behind which allows uh, to figure out that we have uh, this input and output budget for this application for uh, this device. And based on this budget, it actually uh, increase or decrease the priority for uh, this input-output. I wouldn't say it's quite efficient from my observation, so it's complicated, but well, it works. Uh, the Kiber is a different approach. It's just like a very simple scheduler which uh, tries uh, not to uh, mess up with lots of mathematics around here, with merge and sorting and things like that. Uh, whichever you prefer, I have actually no recommendation right now because it's a relatively new thing. Uh, I would say that actually use the default with your current uh, modern Linux kernel. Most likely it would work better. So. Um, from my experience, there is no such drastic changes comparing to, um, like, if you use deadline or knob on SSDs. So basically, uh, not that 
important. Uh, after that, uh, we have NVMe driver, and then sometimes we have improved uh, uh, parallel SCSI driver for that. Uh, there is a good upgradable, uh, which uh, maintainers keep current, uh, diagram of a Linux input-output stack. Uh, you can take a look and figure out uh, much more details than I can put on the slide. Uh, it's basically not that up-to-date about BulkMQ, but, well, actually, it's up-to-date, like, for two years ago or one year ago. So, basically, it's fresh enough to figure out what is going on. And I hope the guys will update that uh, soon. Um, what is actually NVMe? NVMe, it's not just a driver, it's a set of standards for uh, input-output drivers, which is quite good currently, and, well, uh, we all appreciate that finally uh, major producers uh, did that. Uh, for Linux, uh, it's just uh, a driver and set of standards how uh, other parts of the stack uh, interact with um, I/O scheduler. Uh, for uh, industry now, it's actually the new standard which is under construction. So basically, um, we have only in VME currently uh, working in stable for uh, local disk. If you, we put something into PCIe, that works perfectly well, fast, and so on. But there are lots of work to make this real for fiber channel, for disk arrays, and that's really the future because uh, that part needs lots of parallelism too. So currently industry works in that direction and results are quite good. So stable now is uh, version 3 of this standard and uh, the already uh, pre-production version 5 uh, can basically allows more than 32 gigs per second uh, for one channel uh, of uh, fiber which connects you to the disk array. So it's very impressive uh, disk performance, I would say. Uh, but the next problem is, like with the latency change, uh, do the other database actually aware of uh, that development? And is it uh, okay just to put the database on this extra uh, fast storage. Uh, would it use that good? I would say that's uh, actually a, diffi a difficult question and uh, mm, we still, for example, in Postgres have uh, no uh, real parallelism in bulk input-output operations. So basically we have a check pointer which is not quite parallel and we have a background writer which is uh, non-parallel. Uh, and that's it. Uh, so basically, uh, the improvement of current storages are all based on high parallelism stor uh, per in storage. And well, the database uh, cannot handle this. So probably uh, it should be a lot of things improved before we can actually benefit. But well, uh, if you move from no op uh, to modern kernel with bulk MQ, I saw the uh, performance improvements like four times. So it, it can be actually quite good, uh, quite good for you, but I'm not sure because I don't know your workload. So, well, uh, situation could be improved, maybe not so drastically like uh, uh, excited developers on NVMe reporting. Uh, what's the latest uh, things uh, in NVMe and uh, bulk MQ during the development cycle of kernel version 4. Uh, the first thing was IO pooling. I, IO pooling. Uh, that's an interesting example. Uh, for a long time, the idea was like if you form an input output request, uh, you send it to the disk, and then uh, disk driver takes care about the results. So you have an IRQ, and you handle it, then the operation of I.O. ended, and then you return to 
uh, the kernel to the user space at so on. Uh, for low latency disk, uh, this is actually not very optimal because you need to wait for the interrupt and that's a long time. Probably your operation will end up sooner uh, and you will have a huge overhead. Um, immediately uh, came up the idea of uh, polling. Uh, so basically then you send the write request uh, through the stack to the disk. Uh, you can constantly poll uh, your device and figure out if it finished or not. And because SSDs are quite fast, uh, we uh, run into another problem. On this polling, you can actually uh, have spend lots of CPU resources. And your CPU is busy and, well, your database is not happy. So after the first naive approach, uh, the so-called hybrid polling was introduced. So basically, current idea is that you send the write request and at some point you pull the device and try to figure out if it finished. Then you sleep for, for a while and then you actually pull again and most likely it would be much more efficient than wait for uh, interrupt. So that was a huge improvement of uh, performance of BulkMQ and NVMe together. Um, there are no new schedulers like BFQ e Cooper for uh, 4.10 or 4.12. Here I think 4.12 is much more correct. Uh, IoTagging was introduced, so basically uh, you can move the request from one queue or to another queue and based on those tags you can uh, manage the priorities of input-output. That was specifically good for um, virtual machines, but I think actually for uh, databases it can be also quite useful because different processes have a different I.O. profile. Uh, and besides of that, there are some direct I.O. improvements uh, in the NVMe uh, connected to the internal optimizations of SSDs. Um, and a final small note on the direct I.O. because we're talking about databases, we are at PostgreSQL dev room and well, that's a question people constantly ask uh, what is the current situation with uh, direct I.O. in Postgres and why not just uh, grab all the source and open every file with for direct. It's simple why you don't do this. So currently PostgreSQL doesn't support uh, direct I.O. for anything useful in production. <laughs> uh, I would put that in that wet way. So we basically can use direct I.O. Uh, for write and write head log. But here's the problem and explanation why Postgres uh, do not use that for something useful. Um, if you open the file with or direct, you need to work with this file exceptionally with or direct. Because if you open the file with or direct and then, I don't know, archive command or uh, something like pg dump or something like this handles, with the, uh, handles this file without or direct, you will have a problems. Most likely some crash or something like this. Uh, and uh, if Postgres uh, works just like a standalone database, that's okay to write, write a headlock with or direct. But if you enable replication, you probably will have an archive command, which is in Postgres can be like just bash script or something completely unaware of how you opened the file. And well, you will run into the problems and because of that, uh, Postgres automatically uh, switch to uh, buffer it IO for write ahead log if, uh, even if you try to use uh, direct IO in this case. Uh, the main problem from my point of view is that uh, direct IO is a very Linux specific thing and you need to invest a lot of efforts to uh, introduce and maintain uh, platform dependent uh, code. 
So basically, even if PostgreSQL community will agree to do this, um, that would be uh, like not easy task because you need to write lots of code specifically for Linux. And generally, PostgreSQL community is not quite uh, easy about uh, bringing into the project very OS-specific things. Uh, well, uh, generally, Direct.io maybe is the best solution we have now, in spite of many uh, people talking that it's not quite good uh, in terms of implementation and so on. Uh, but, well, I think finally Postgres will move towards this direction um, because now it's like basically the only classical database which doesn't use that. Uh, I don't know, actually, uh, it actually is a good idea if we try to figure out if Linux version of MS SQL Server uses that. But, well, the only exception is MS SQL Server for Windows, yeah, because they do not have direct IO. Uh, MySQL uses, uh, Oracle uses, DB2 uses. Um, so that's all about direct IO and all about the uh, uh, recent uh, changes in Linux stack. And if you have questions, it's time to, to ask them. Thank you. Yeah. Question? In your talk, you described only like bare metal implementations of PostgreSQL, which means like private cloud, private cloud where you can negotiate certain things with a provider, and the public cloud has certain, uh, has those things inside of it, but it's kind of totally in a different way. Uh, well, I would say that uh, most likely they all have the same things inside. Because uh, even if you deal with the public cloud, uh, they have serious problems with improving performance. And I don't believe they do not use this achievement of Linux kernel. But with public cloud, basically, you can never be sure what exactly they do. And that's a part of the game. But, we, uh, with, so, but it stops be, being a PostgreSQL problem. It becomes a question of choosing the flavor. Uh, well, uh, I still believe that many people use private cl cloud or bare metal installation, actually. And for them, it's a problem. Uh, so, well, uh, we are not talking about maybe private clouds here, but for, uh, for public clouds here, but for private clouds, it, it's still a problem. You need to tune your Linux, you need to figure out what's going on. <laughs> So basically, many many of those improvements were actually introduced for uh, uh, private clouds. Like, but uh, so a little bit on that. So the thing is, you are provided with Virtio BLK device. In case you are lucky, you might negotiate Virtio BLK multi, uh, with multi queue support. Yeah. Uh, but it's still different from what you described because Virtio BLK device is not SSD or HDD or NVMe. It's yeah. as a thing on its own. Yeah, well, um, I, would, I would say that uh, the idea of how to improve performance of Postgres uh, on uh, virtual I.O., on any virtual I.O., it's quite a different problem. Because, for example, here we're talking about the lacking of parallelism in the Linux kernel infrastructure to handle SSDs. That's one problem. But if we talk about um, virtualization, for example, immediately emerged the problem of uh, unstable latency, which is quite different story and, well, it's outside the scope of this talk. Uh, it's also the problem and quite serious problem, but, well, it's, it's a different story. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, have you seen much uh, demand or traction for open channel SSDs? And if so, like how far out do you think that might be? Well, uh, I would say I have heard about that because I was interested in the topic. Uh, but uh, regret to say I do not see that much in production because, well, my primary job, I'm working for the customers and then the customers running databases, they tend to buy good SSDs and use uh, vendor-specific things for them. It's it, it just real life. So I will quite appreciate to have some feedback if someone use and well I 
I will take a look on it. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, please? In just in your last slide, you have atomic flag. May you give what? some details about uh, atomic? Any uh, details about? Well, uh, uh, some SSDs have uh, uh, another option or atomic, which is quite useful for writes. Like but that. the problem is you cannot use O atomic without O direct. So basically you need to use O direct to benefit from such low level optimization uh, for SSDs. But will you support it for any uh, block size? 16K, 64K, or, or only 4K? I don't know, to be honest. Because, well, Postgres doesn't support that. I <laughs> don't know. And uh, what is the smallest block for DirectAO? Acceptable? Because you speak about blocks, but you have file system, right? So even you write one byte, it will be still 4K today. Well, uh, Postgres operates 8K if you don't recompile it. So basically, IO can bring benefits on that uh, block size. And basically, I believe it also will bring lots of benefits on larger sizes of the blocks. Because, well, the whole mechanism was introduced partially for databases, and many analytic databases tend to have a larger block size. Okay, and any plans on we don't need to call if sync when you use DirectIO? Because right now it's... It, it's a different story. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it, it doesn't depend. Uh, basically, Postgres heavily relies on uh, F-Sync. I don't know if you probably visit Tomas' talk uh, yesterday, yeah, I believe? Yeah about F-Sync yes. problems, uh, you will see that basically all mechanism is about F-Sync. So basically, uh, it's like POSIX standard uh, as we understand that, and uh, anyway, you, know, you need to issue F-Sync. But, but why? If you're already on, on O-Direct, so 20 years ago, Solaris used O-Direct without F-Sync. So why Linux still you need F-Sync? It's a good question, actually. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, probably we have several right persons to answer that low-level question. <laughs> yeah, the reason is that there is a development cost of implementing direct I/O on all operating systems, so we don't have the manpower to do it yet. We may next year or the year after that, but that's the only reason. Thanks, Elvira. Any other questions, please? So, thank you, Ilya. Thank you.